Lindsay, I want to read to you a Truth Social post from the former president. I'll cut to the chase. He has selected J.D. Vance as his running mate for the 2024 presidential campaign. Let me read this Truth Social post in toto. Quote, after lengthy deliberation and thought and considering the tremendous talents of many others, I have decided that the person best suited to assume the position of Vice President of the United States is Senator J.D. Vance of the great state of Ohio. Continuing, direct quote, J.D. honorably served our country in the Marine Corps, graduated from Ohio State University in two years, summa cum laude, and is a Yale Law School graduate, where he was the editor of the Yale Law Journal and president of the Yale Law Veterans Association. J.D.'s book, Hillbilly Elegy, became a major bestseller and movie, and it has championed the hardworking men and women of our country. J.D. had a very successful business career in technology. Again, I'm quoting this Truth Social post from the former president and finance, and now during the campaign, will be strongly focused on the people he fought so brilliantly for, the American workers and farmers in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Ohio, Minnesota, and far beyond. There you have it. On Truth Social, the former President of the United States, Donald Trump, officially announcing that J.D. Vance, 39-year-old senator from the state of Ohio, one and a half years in the United States Senate, will be his running mate in the 2024 campaign. Major, you had mentioned um, that he is a, a relatively political newcomer, a year and a half in the Senate. Um, we, of course, are familiar with his book that turned into the very popular movie. What do we know about his credentials that make him ready for the moment today? Well, first and most importantly, he was able to patch up his differences with former President Trump. Anyone who does a quick Internet search will find in 2016... Not only was J.D. Vance critical of former President Trump, then a candidate for the Republican Party nomination for the first time in 2016, he was acidically critical of former President Trump, describing him in one article as potentially America's next Hitler, describing his particular rhetoric about helping the world class as rhetorical heroin, highly critical of former President Trump seeking the Republican nomination in 2016. Those days are gone. And J.D. JD, JD Vance has said publicly many times, the movement is larger than I thought it was, and it is time for me to suck it up and join this movement. And since he made that decision, as he prepared to run for the Senate in Ohio and won the endorsement of former President Trump, an endorsement, by the way, that catapulted him to the top of a very contested Republican primary and made him not only the nominee, but the future senator from Ohio. J.D. Vance has been not only the most stalwart, dependable, but most aggressive defender of former President Trump's approach on policy, politics, and even rhetoric. And for that reason, he rose to the top of this list and now has been chosen by the former president as his running mate in this campaign. Just reiterating the fact that Vance has been in Trump's corner, making that appeal on television. In fact, he was just on Face the Nation with our own Margaret Brennan recently, and he was vigorously defending the fact that the former president needed immunity to do his job, as he believed, as a future president, of course, in the wake of that decision from the Supreme Court. He has defended the former president when it comes to January 6th. And he obviously came, as many in the nation did, after the attempted assassination on Saturday uh, to his corner, to his defense, actually posting on Twitter and alleging that it was the current president's own rhetoric that led us there, saying the central premise of the Biden campaign is that President Donald Trump is an authoritarian fascist who must be stopped at all costs. J.D. Vance on Twitter saying... On July 13th, just two days ago, the night of the attempted assassination, that rhetoric led directly to President Trump's attempted assassination. Of course, we know President Biden has tried to cool the temperature on both sides. Um, let's go back to you, Major, as we continue to watch the roll call here at the RNC with this major news of Trump picking J.D. Vance as his running mate. Finn, let's listen to the floor. The process is about to wrap up. Florida. <laughs> Florida, 125 delegates. Madam Secretary and everybody in this great city. On behalf of our entire family and on behalf of the 125 delegates in the unbelievable state of Florida, we hereby nominate every single one of them for the greatest president that's ever lived, and that's Donald J. Trump, hereby declaring him the Republican nominee 
for President of the United States of America. the delegation and the rules and procedures of this convention, Florida, 125 votes, President Trump. We are waiting J.D. Vance's arrival. President of the United States, Senator J.D. Vance. Why don't we liberate these United States for the ones who need it worse? Let the rest of the world Senator J.D. Vance, J.D. Vance making his way ever so slowly to the center podium here at Fiserv Forum. When you are representing yourself as a vice presidential nominee of the people, what you do is spend ample time with the delegates of your party, which Senator Vance is quite clearly doing. You see right near him, his wife, Usha, they met at Yale University, students there. Senator Vance had a distinguished academic career at Yale and at Ohio State University. Uh, it is worth noting that and as he was making his way through the Ohio delegation, two bear hugs with the sitting governor, Mike DeWine. Also worth noting that J.D. Vance in the United States Senate took the seat of Rob Portman, a decidedly bipartisan Republican senator, previously before being in the United States Senate, served in the George W. Bush administration a kind of personification of that Republican establishment of old. Republican establishment that, as a candidate in 2015 and in pursuit and capturing of the Republican nomination in 2016, Donald Trump vanquished, or at least began the process of vanquishing, which, to Caitlin Huey Burns' point just a moment ago, has now been fully vanquished. The establishment Republican Party of George H.W. Bush and George W. Bush is no longer. It is, in any way, shape, or form, within a Trump Republican Party. There may still be some advocates, but they have a diluted voice, and they do not play the central role that they once did. When this 
pick was announced, I was texting with some uh, Republican operatives who I would describe as very MAGA Republicans of the Steve Bannon-esque uh, type of mold, and they were cheering this decision. This is a decision that really galvanizes the base. But I will also say, talking to Republicans in Vance's orbit, those who have worked with him on campaigns and uh, seen him campaign, note that what you just saw right there, Vance with his wife, present a generational change. That's a huge contrast, of course, to the top of the ticket. And also, they believe that his connections could be in the suburbs as well. Because of what you mentioned, we all know his biography, but his pedigree also, they believe, makes that outreach. Caleb Burns, thank you so very much. Good evening and welcome to America Decides Campaign 2024 and CBS News coverage of the Republican National Convention here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin right now. That's right. You see the former president, Donald Trump, in his first public appearance. You can see the bandage on his ear. Let's listen in. You will hear this crowd go electric. The bullet missed him just enough to save his life to be the next president of the United States. For this song, we have believed for so long that God will make some changes in this country. And he's about to make a change in the current administration and send them home. Thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. Tonight, we make the decision on what's right for America. More prosperity, less gas prices, less food prices, help for our veterans, and God bless our military wherever they are in this United States. And abroad, there would be no war Ladies there and gentlemen, when President Trump please was president. welcome the next president, president of the United of States, Donald J. Trump. Convention, you can see that his right ear bandaged after being grazed by a bullet just 48 hours ago. You can hear now many of the delegates and attendees here are singing along with this song. President being greeted by close supporters, including Tucker Carlson and his family in the VIP family box there. Many of his family were instrumental in pushing Senator J.D. Vance to be the vice presidential pick. And that's our first shot of the two of them together. Lee Greenwood just saying, you will not take this man down. Robert Costa. A moment where former President Trump is visibly showing some emotion. This is someone who so often is projecting political confidence. The last time I've seen this kind of expression, I've covered him for a long time, was on election night 2016, when he seemed to be stunned by victory, now taken aback clearly by the reception here at the Republican National Convention, opening night, a former president recovering from an assassination attempt. The crowd on its feet, cheering former President Trump, there with his running mate just 39 years old, J.D. Vance, 
presenting a generational contrast. This is echoes of other moments in American history. 1981, when President Ronald Reagan shot and came to crowds months after, after recovering. But this is beyond parties. We've seen Democrats like Gabrielle Giffords, Republicans like President Reagan shot. Resilience is a part of the American character, whether you are Republican or Democrat, carrying on. Tonight, President Trump, former President Trump does just that. Day one of a convention, back to politics, but also a human moment as well. And such a critical one for the country to see the former president having just survived an assassination attempt in a public setting. There's lots of security here, of course, the highest security levels you can have in the country right here. But seeing him in public around people is significant for the country to see. And Nora, it's worth pointing out, and I think Robert made an excellent point about the look on former President Trump's face. He looks emotional. Softer, more emotional, less aggressive than he typically does in face of a partisan crowd. That, I think, is being absorbed by this crowd and the nation writ large. John Dickerson, your thoughts? Well, uh, you all have covered the, this extraordinary and dramatic moment. Um, I would just note one other comeback uh, by the former president. There was a time after the uh, riots of January 6 where the leaders, the Republican leaders in the House and the Senate blamed him for lying to the country and leading uh, to that attempt to disenfranchise 81 million people. Uh, after that, there was a period where many people thought that's the end of Donald Trump and in the Republican Party. Glenn Youngkin, governor of Virginia, who spoke so fulsomely about Donald, Donald Trump tonight, ran away from Trump when he ran for governor in Virginia. Then in 2022, when Trump's candidates didn't do very well, people thought, well, that's really the end of it for Donald Trump. Before the tragic events of Saturday, it was already an extraordinary story that Donald Trump, who had been vilified by the leaders of the Senate and House in his own party, came to a convention that is as unified as anybody can think of in modern memory. That was the, that was the comeback that existed before this physical and emotional one we're seeing right now. Chance and now. We the, love Trump. And there was also chance of fight. Remember, that is what former President Trump yelled as he left the rally stage in Butler, Pennsylvania on Saturday. Now they're taking his seat. He was raising his fist in the air just as he did on Saturday after that assassination attempt. This is also a, a crowd that is moved as well, many of them holding up their phones, taking pictures, some of them emotional, seeing Donald Trump for the first time as well with his bandaged ear. And speaking next is Sean O'Brien, president of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, an influential labor union. And that is the first time a Teamsters president has addressed the RNC. The Teamsters have yet to endorse Trump or President Biden in this year's election. So let's check in with Ed O'Keefe. And Ed, why is Sean O'Brien going to be the keynote speaker? Because it's not every day that the leader of a major labor union addresses a Republican national convention. In fact, in the case of the Teamsters, it's never happened before. But Sean O'Brien will be here tonight as the union considers its first ever Republican presidential nomination, or at least its first in several years. They've made five-figure donations to both parties this year because there are members who believe that the union should consider endorsing Donald Trump after their concerns with the economic policies of President Biden. And yet there are many other members of the Teamsters tonight furious that Sean O'Brien will be here. Either way, it's a coup for the Trump campaign as they continue trying to cut into different elements of the Democratic Party's umbrella. Organized labor, black and Latino men, the young, women as well. If Sean O'Brien, as he begins his remarks here, can convince his members to vote Republican and keep battleground states, Trump might win the White House again. Let's listen in to Sean O'Brien. I'd like to give my peeps from the greatest state in the nation, Massachusetts, some props. What's up? First, I want to thank the hardworking Teamsters and union members here in Milwaukee who play vital roles in the building and operations of this convention. I also want to thank President Donald Trump for opening the RNC's doors to the Teamsters Union 
in inviting me to speak before you tonight. I travel all across this country and meet with my members every week. You know what I see? An American worker being taken for granted. Workers being sold out to big banks, big tech, corporates, and the elite. And I'm not the only one who sees this. Everyday families see it. The American people aren't stupid. They know the system is broken. We all know how Washington is run. Working people have no chance of winning this fight. That's why I'm here today, because I refuse to keep doing the same things my predecessors did. Today, today, the Teamsters are here to say we are not beholden to anyone or any party. We will create an agenda and work with a bipartisan coalition ready to accomplish something real for the American worker. And I don't care about getting criticized. It's an honor to be the first Teamster in our 121-year history to address the Republican National Convention. <laughs> Several months ago, I asked the RNC and the DNC for the opportunity to speak. To be frank, when President Trump invited me to speak at this convention, there was political unrest on the left and on the right. Hard to believe. Anti-union groups demanded the President rescind his invitation. The left called me a traitor. And this is precisely why it's so important for me to be here today. Think about this. Think about this. The Teamsters are doing something correct. If the extremes in both parties think I shouldn't be on this stage. President Trump had the backbone to open the doors to this Republican convention, and that's unprecedented. No other nominee in the race would have invited the Teamsters into this arena. Now, you can have whatever opinion you want, but one thing is clear. President Trump is a candidate who is not afraid of hearing from new, loud, and often critical voices. And I think we all can agree, whether people like him or they don't like him, in light of what happened to him on Saturday, he has proven to be one tough SOB. Now, when I won the presidency of the Teamsters in a national election two and a half years ago, we started reaching across the aisle. In the past, the Teamsters have endorsed GOB candidates, including Nixon, Reagan, and George H.W. Bush. But over the last 40 years, the Republican Party has really pursued strong relationships with organized labor. There are some in the party who stand in active opposition to labor unions. This, too, must change. And I want to be clear. At the end of the day, the Teamsters are not interested 
if you have a D, R, or an I next to your name. We want to know one thing. What are you doing to help American workers? As a negotiator, I know that no window or door should ever be permanently shut. In my administration, the Teamsters reached out to eight Republican senators who stood up for railroad Teamsters over our fight for paid sick leave. Josh Hawley was one of them. We started talking. Senator Hawley changed his position on national right to work. Then we started walking. Senator Hawley walked a Teamsters picket line in St. Louis and a UAW picket line in Wentzville, Missouri. More than that, I want to recognize Senator Hawley for his direct, relentless, and pointed questioning of corporate talking heads, lawyers, CEOs, and apologists. He has shown he is not willing to accept their pillaging of working people's pocketbooks. I know from a career in negotiating that you get nowhere by slamming your fist on the table. The first step is to listen. The Teamsters and the GOP may not agree on many issues, but a growing group has shown the courage to sit down and consider points of view that aren't funded by big money think tanks. Senators like J.D. Vance, Roger Marshall, and Representatives Nicole Malliotakis, Mike Lawler, and Brian Fitzpatrick are among elected officials who truly care about working people. And this group is expanding and is putting fear into those who have monopolized our very broken system in America today. There are far too many people on both sides of the aisle still caught up in knee-jerk reactions to unions, who subscribe to the same tired claptrap that unions destroy American companies. Take a moment to consider United Postal Service, which is the largest private sector logistics company, and it's been unionized for more than 100 years. More than 350,000 Teamsters make it run. We work for good middle-class wages, quality health care, and secure pensions. There are work rules that ensure fairness and due process for both sides. UPS is the most efficient package delivery company in the world. But let's not forget that UPS doesn't provide these great wages and benefits out of the kindness of its heart. UPS does it because the Teamsters fight for it, all 350,000 of us. You know, corporatists hate when working people join together to form unions. But for a century, major employers have waged a war against labor by forming corporate unions of their own. We need to call the Chamber of Commerce and the business roundtables what they are. They are unions for big business. And here's another fact. Against gigantic multinational corporations, an individual worker has zero power. It's only when Americans band together in democratic unions that we win real improvements on wages, benefits, and working conditions. Companies like Amazon are bigger than most national economies. Amazon is valued over $2 trillion. That makes it the 14th largest economy in the world. What is sickening is that Amazon has abandoned any national allegiance. Amazon's sole focus is on lining its own pockets. Remember, elites have no party, elites have no nation. Their loyalty is to the balance sheet and the stock price at the expense of the American worker. In my office in Washington, D.C., I can see the United States Capitol from my window. I see well-intentioned people arrive in Washington and get eaten up 
by an unforgiving system. The responsibility to average Americans takes a back seat. The objective now becomes survival. Fundraiser after fundraiser, corporate consultants hedge every initiative. The Hill crawls with lifers, bouncing from government jobs to corporate jobs and back again. I think we can all agree D.C. is a pretty treacherous area. Most legislation is never meant to go anywhere, and it's all talk. And in America, talk isn't cheap. It's very expensive, and it comes at the cost of our own country. <laughs> Working people know our system is broken. The elites are not laboring on behalf of workers. There is a political caste system that prevents citizens from accessing their representatives to hold them accountable. For a moment in time, working people in America were seen as essential. Sadly, it took a global pandemic for political and corporate elites to notice this fact. But ask yourself this question. Since the end of the pandemic, when was the last time you heard major news outlets regularly to refer to workers as essential? You haven't. The men and women who provide goods and services, deliver packages, stock grocery shelves, care for patients, pick up your trash, and keep our communities safe are taken for granted. All the while, the stock market boomed. Housing prices hit record highs, and corporate salaries skyrocket. But the income of everyday Americans are shrinking in the face of inflation at the gas pumps, at the grocery store, with the electrical bill, and with the car insurance. This has got to change. <laughs> Never forget, American workers own this nation. We are not renters. We are not tenants. But the corporate elite treat us like squatters, and that is a crime. We've got to fix it. Now, this will shock you. This will shock you. To paraphrase Senator Mark Wayne Mullen, it's time for both sides of Congress to stand their butts up. We need trade policies that put American workers first. It needs to be easier for companies to remain in America. We need legal protections that make it safer for workers to get a contract. We must stop corporations from abandoning local communities to inflate their bottom line. We need meaningful bankruptcy reform today Corporate vultures buy up companies like Yellow Freight with the intent of driving them into bankruptcy and feasting on their remains. The courts leave workers begging for crumbs as third-tier creditors. Labor law must be reformed. Americans vote for a union but can never get a union contract. Companies fire workers who try to join unions and hide behind toothless laws that are meant to protect working people but are manipulated to benefit corporations. This is economic terrorism at its best. An individual cannot withstand such an assault. A fired worker cannot afford corporate delays, and these greedy employers know it. There are no consequences for the company, only the worker. We need corporate welfare reform. Under our current system, massive companies like Amazon, Uber, Lyft, and Walmart take zero responsibilities for the workers they employ. These companies offer no real health insurance, no retirement benefits, no paid leave, relying on underfunded public assistance. And who foots the bill? The individual taxpayer. The biggest recipients of welfare in this country are corporations, and this is real corruption. We must put workers first. What could be more important to the security of our nation than a long-term investment in the American worker? 
In 2021, Teamsters nationwide elected me to fight for them, and that's precisely what I'm doing. Something is wrong in this country, and we need to say it out loud. I will always speak for America and the American worker, both union and non-union. I challenge each and every one of you, and especially my friends on the Democratic side, to embrace cooperation, to truly collaborate to achieve meaningful and productive change, to ensure we make this great nation the wor in this world the bigger, faster, and strongest nation in the entire world. I love this country. The Teamsters love this country. Our 1.3 million members move America on the roads, in the ports, on the rail, and in the air. And at the end of the day, if the powers to be stop me from raising my voice on behalf of American workers, I will not have one single regret. I still carry my commercial driver's license. I still have my place on the union seniority list. You'll find me back in Boston driving a tractor trailer, delivering equipment for Shaughnessy and Ahern, because I have the protection of a union contract that gives me the freedom to speak my mind and to fight like hell. God bless the greatest nation. Thank you very much. Well, extraordinary remarks from Sean O'Brien, who is the general president of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. This is the first time that a leader of such a storied union like this has addressed a Republican convention ever and uh, made some stunning remarks about working class people. And, and uh, I want to bring in Major Garrett sure. on this. Major. First, the first thing he said that really revved up the audience was that after the weekend event, Donald Trump is clearly one tough SOB. Huge applause line. But I think what will be recorded historically, Nora, is this is the most aggressive and certainly the longest anti-big business speech ever delivered at a Republican National Convention, which explains part of the populist politics of Donald Trump and how it has changed the Republican Party at the grassroots level and how it may change the Republican Party going forward with a running mate like J.D. Vance. But Optically, he was bashing corporate profits. Corporate profits, corporate greed, and yet, resistance to work rules, resistance to higher wages. But Donald Trump wants to lower again the corporate tax rate. From 21% his to 20%. His tax policies in 2017, this is, this is a fact, benefited the wealthy more than it benefited workers working class Americans. By percentage of wealth gained from those tax cuts, absolutely. But he also had aggressive trade policies. Robert Costa has talked about this many times, that those in the labor movement or those who are white uh, blue collar workers saw as more responsive to their consternation over decades of trade policies that they thought were harmful to their economic future. This is going to be the heart of this debate for this presidential election because people are voting with their paychecks, with their pocketbooks, I should say, because they feel like their paychecks are smaller and they feel like they're paying more for basic goods.